OK, so thank you for the invitation to speak. So let me just jump right in. So we know that not all low NG effective theories can be obtained as the low NG limit of a UV complete quantum gravity theory. So a well known example is just Einstein Maxwell theory with no charge matter. So this violates, for example, the weak gravity conjecture, but if you don't trust that, that it has the word conjecture in it, then there is actually a holographic proof of this as well by Harlow and Aguri. So how and well, when can we tell from a low energy theory that it cannot be UV completed in ADS CFT? Now this question is too hard, so let me just um, restrict to scalar theories uh, and just consider minimally coupled uh, scalar um, with an ADS vacuum for phi equals zero. Okay, and then we can ask again, for which potentials um, could this uh, theory be holographic? Well, that question is still too hard. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find conditions on the potential V for when the theory is not holographic. So the claim I'm going to make in this talk is the following. So I'm going to claim that bulk effective field theories in ADS that violate the Penrose inequality are incompatible with ADS CFT. And of course I should tell you what the Penrose inequality is. Well, it roughly says that the area of a marginally trapped surface is less than the area of a static black hole at the same mass. This is one way to write the Penrose inequality. And okay, it's a special time of marginally trapped surface. I will return to that soon. Okay, so why, why do we think that, that this should be true in holography? So let me repeat an argument that was made a few years ago by, by Netta Englard and Gary Horowitz. So consider this setup. So we have some asymptotically ADS black hole, uh, let's say one-sided form from collapse. We have some surface mu here and some partial Cauchy slice that runs out to the conformal boundary. And then I'm going to assume that, that mu is minimal on this slice. So you just take some other uh, cold dimension two space like surface here and it's going to have a large area. And I'm going to assume it's marginally trapped, so you know, it's uh, inwards light rays are converging, it's outwards light rays are just neither converging nor diverging. Okay, and then thanks to this work here by, by Engelhardt and Wall, the area of that, there, yeah. There was some other condition right on the gradient of the angle. Good, good, yeah, yeah. Yeah, watch this space once we get a little bit further in the slide. Yeah, there's a, one more technical condition. Okay, I can just say it now. So the thing is like, this surface you should be able to like perturb it slightly into the space time and it becomes proper trapped. Yeah, so there's that technical condition, yeah. So if you have that condition as well, then uh, it turns out that there is a CFT state called a coarse grain state whose, whose entropy is given by this area. Even though, you know, this is not the HRT surface in this space time, there exists another state where the HRT surface has exactly this area, okay. Now this is, of course, less than the maximum entropy if you just maximize over a set of quantum states that contains the original state, okay? And, okay, this spacetime has mass m. So here I'm just maximizing over CFT states rho that has fixed CFT energy e, or mass m in the spacetime, okay? So that's clearly larger. And then there is a result from uh, statistical mechanics that basically says that the microcanonical ensemble is the most entropic state at the fixed value for the energy. And then finally, I'm going to assume that holography tells me that the von Neumann entropy of a microcanonical ensemble is given by the area of some static black hole divided by 4 gm. And so where does this come from? Well, it seems very reasonable. We know that the thermal field double should be dual to some static black hole, at least about the Hogan-Page transition, um, where the entropy is given by the area of the horizon. So it's reasonable the same is true for microcanonical ensemble. But there, yeah, you, you can be a little bit more rigorous. There is uh, Don Morolf defined this path integral for the microcanonical ensemble, where you can show that the saddles that dominate are the ones that are most entropic. And then either you can assume, well, okay, there are a few ways to go here. Um, if you assume that the microcanonical ensemble doesn't have any spontaneous breaking of time translational symmetry, 
then the bulk should be at some static space time because the microcanonical ensemble is definitely some time independent state. So it's very reasonable, it's a static black hole. Okay, so, but this is essentially a derivation of the Penrose inequality. The area of mu is less than the area of the corresponding static black hole of the same mass. And then, okay, there is this technical condition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah. So we maximize over states row that all have the same oh, fixed mass. Yeah, I, I should have changed this by now because every time I gave this talk, I got those questions. So I, I should learn. <laughs> I, uh, I have to remember. <laughs> okay. So ADS CFT seems to say that the area of this uh, surface mu, this margin trapped surface mu, is less than the area of a black hole at mass m. Taking the contrapositive, it's it says that you know if this inequality is violated, then ADS CFT doesn't hold. This argument at least breaks down. So of course, in the talk, I'm going to try to look for such violations. Um, but let, uh, so essentially, I want to test this inequality. But how can I test this inequality? Because there is a problem. So you see, here's the inequality, and it says area mu less than area of static black hole. Which static black hole? We don't really understand black hole uniqueness in ADS very well. So what, what stat black, static black hole do I plug in there? You know, how can I test it when I don't even know what inequality says? Well, it turns out that if I assume that mu is spherically symmetric, I can make some progress. So I'm just going to consider spherically symmetric mu going forward. then we can essentially modify this argument from earlier a little bit, uh, where now I'm going to maximize over states rho where the energy density is fixed, maybe even the one point function of the stress tensor. Uh, so now I just have a homogeneous state, so now I should be able to enforce um, spherical symmetry at least. And it turns out that there is a microcanonical path integral uh, for this kind of construction given by Brown and York. So Okay, I still have the assumption about like, you know, no spontaneous breaking of time translation symmetry, but at least I, I, I should be able to add the word spherically symmetric in front here. Okay, there are some subtleties about this path integral as well. Um, like no one has checked whether it's a ghost free, blah, blah, blah. And Don Marol, you know, was complaining about that when I was giving talk at UCSB. So I, I, this, this, uh, this uh, argument is not watertight. So, if you don't believe it, then maybe you have to like let me assume that the microcanonical ensemble doesn't have spontaneous breaking of, of translational symmetry in a CFT. But okay, still we have to seemingly construct all spherically symmetric black holes, potential here black holes in our theory, which is annoying because I want to like change the potential on this in scaly field theory and see what happens to the Penrose inequality. So do I have to construct hairy black holes every time I change the potential a little bit? Turns out that I don't have to because there's a theorem from a little bit earlier this year that shows that the null energy condition implies that the area of a static spherically symmetric black hole at mass m is less than the area of ADS Schwarzschild at mass m. So the only static spherically symmetric black hole that can dominate the microcanonical ensemble is ADS Schwarzschild. So with spherical symmetry, I can check this thing. Okay, good, this is an inequality now we can actually try to check. So to have any sense whether this thing could be true or not, it's useful to remind ourselves of Penrose's original argument for the Penrose inequality. If you let, I'm gonna modify it a little bit, but I'm gonna use his main ingredients, but I'm gonna do it in ADS. So the same setup, but mu is, um, oh, yeah, there's something going on with the colors here. There is like a dashed line here, which is the horizon that intersects at this point, okay? So this is the intersection with the horizon on this slice. By outermost minimality, we have this inequality here. And then if you use the area theorem and cosmic censorship, you get that that's less than the area of this surface on the horizon at late times. Um, the area theorem just tells you that the area is increasing along the horizon and the cosmic censorship comes in to argue that this horizon just suddenly doesn't terminate somewhere because a naked singularity comes down here and just stops it or whatever, so there is no late times. 
And then if you assume that the spacetime settled down to a black hole, let me just assume spherical symmetry, so it's static rather than stationary. Um, then you have this, this inequality here. Oh, sorry, it should be equality. And then that's, of course, just less than the area of the most entropic static black hole because the entropy is just the area. And that's essentially Penrose's version uh, of the argument. Okay, but cosmic censorship is false in ADS for generic matter respecting the null energy condition. So Penrose's original argument doesn't work for all EFTs in ADS. So maybe this is violated. And since I'm giving this talk, you know, you probably have guessed by now that it is violated for some theories. So let's look for violations. So let me now just give a short overview of what I've said and what I will say. So what am I doing? I, I want to construct theories that violate the Penrose inequality. Why? Well, to rule out non-holographic theories. How? So that's kind of what I will do. I will review and prove theorems for when the Penrose inequality must hold. That tells us where not to look for violations. I'll do a consistency check. I'll numerically check that the Penrose inequality holds in like top-down string potentials where there are no theorems that guarantee that it holds. Somehow if I find violations, something is, is badly wrong with this whole story. But it's non-trivial because we have no theorems that guarantee that it will work out. And then I'm going to numerically construct violations and produce exclusion plots in the space of couplings. And I will also find an analytical exclusion condition, which is kind of a generalization or a analog of the BF bound for higher couplings, not just uh, constraining the mass of scalar fields. Okay, so what's the status of the Penrose inequality? So it's not proven except in special cases. The most relevant for us is uh, D equals four asymptotically ADS with spherical symmetry and the dominant energy condition. So maybe I should remind you what the dominant energy condition says. It says that you know, if you have the Einstein's equations, GAB plus lambda GAB is the cosmological constant, equals the stress tensor GAB, then the stress tensor is non-negative and contracted with two time-like vectors. So TAB contracted with UA GB is non-negative. And Okay, I basically, in, in my paper, I had uh, I generalized the proof to all dimensions with spherical planar hyperbolic symmetry, but that's not really the most interesting part, but it tells us where we should not look for violations. So basically the theorem says this here, that if you have spherical symmetry and you have the dominant energy condition, then, then this inequality is true. ADS Schwarzschild has larger area. Okay. But let's not linger on that because the dominant energy condition is typically violated in holography. Um, just the standard example, you take some um, primary operator on the boundary that's relevant, it's a scalar signal trace, and if it's dual to some bulk field, that bulk field will have negative mass squared. And that actually leads to a violation of the deck. So as long as this potential is negative somewhere, then we have a violation of the deck. And here are some example top-down potentials from string theory. You see that this, these are not just negative, they become very negative, uh, exponentially so. And there's no proof of the Penrose inequality for these potentials. So it's interesting to check whether we can find violations here. I would be in trouble if I find violations. Okay, so what I'm going to do is, for a given potential, I'm going to numerically generate large ensembles of initial data sets and look for violations in each uh, data set. So I'm going to work at the moment of time symmetry and then it turns out if you look at the Einstein constraint equations, the only data that's left to specify then is the radius of the marginally trapped surface mu and the scalar profile outside. So once I specify moments of time symmetry, I just need to give this number r0, I need to give the scalar profile 5r, and then the geometry follows from solving the constraints. And then you can produce a complete initial data set by gluing a second copy of this initial data sets to itself along r0. So you really get something that's complete. And then it turns out that it was very nice in spherical symmetry, you can actually solve the, for the math, you can actually solve the constraint equations as an integral 
and it looks like this. Um, so you know, uh, I have that the uh, area of mu is less than the area of a uh, black hole or ADS Schwarzschild at mass m. So area of mu is essentially you know specified by this r zero, and the area of the black hole at mass m is specified by this m. So to fix r zero, I want to like minimize this m. So I want to choose a scalar profile that minimizes um, this m. So I have competing contributions. I have the negative piece from the, from the potential. And I have this positive gradient term. And then I have this hidden thing here, chi, which is unfortunately also an integral of the scalar field, the gradient of the scalar field. So if I try to vary this with, a, with phi, unfortunately, I don't get a local Euler Lagrange equation. I get some integral differential equation. So I'm going to do something dumb. Um, I'm just going to pick some ansatz for the scalar potentials. And I'm going to randomly draw the coefficients from some distribution and look for violations. OK, that, that sounds like a pretty dumb thing to do, maybe. Uh, but actually, like, you know, if you, you stare at this thing, there, 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 aren't, there isn't that, like, you know, most stuff you can do won't work. Because if you have very weakly profiles, you will just accumulate a bunch of gradients. So that's like very suboptimal. So you want something that just falls off as slowly as it can, and it can and accumulates like you know a lot of negative energy density from the potential. So you just want to have a big condensate that falls off as slowly as it can. And and um, so I'm, I pick these two uh, profiles. For this one, you just have essentially this. This is the scaling dimension. So this is basically just a profile that has the uh, slowest fall off that's compatible with finite mass. And then I just have some coefficients eta that I'm going to draw from some distribution. And another profile is this logarithmic one here, which also has a very slow fall off. But of course, it needs to have compact support. I can't go as a log out to infinity. Um, and it turns out, I won't go into detail, but it turns out that you can reason about parametrically how large the ranges um, that you should draw these ones from. Because it turns out if you choose them too big, and you solve the constraint equations outward, the universe will just close off, and you won't have asymptotically ADS uh, space time. So, you know, you can just sample them uniformly from some uh, distribution that you know roughly, uh, from some interval you know roughly how large it should be. Okay. And the first thing I do as a sanity check, I took, take this list of potentials uh, from um, top down examples where, you know, we have some supergravity and dimensionally reduce some compact dimensions, you, you get some potentials like this. Um, they're very negative. And then I just um, test my procedure on them. I also try free scalar fields that, is about, uh, that, that, that have masses above the BF bound. So what do I do? I generate 10,000 initial data sets for each theory and check the Penrose inequality. And the top-down potentials and free tachyonic scalars about the BF bound seem to respect the Penrose inequality. At this point, you should be like, okay, so what? Like, I don't care. Maybe you just sample the space of initial data really poorly, and then it doesn't mean anything. And like, that should be your complaint. So what I can maybe say to relieve you a little bit is that once I start like dialing these potentials, you know, there are thresholds that once I cross them, I very easily generate a bunch of violations. So at least this space of initial data that I'm sampling from can easily produce violations once I consider other potentials. Okay, but this is just a consistency check. It's of course not a proof that the Penrose inequality holds in these theories. Okay, but now let's look at some generic potentials. So I'm just gonna take some negative mass squared. This minus nine over 16 looks very particular, but it's, it's not important. I just happen to take m squared equals to one half times the m squared of the bf bound, okay? So you can change the mass a little bit, it doesn't, doesn't really matter. And then I scan over these couplings, g3 and g4. And let me first draw this black line here. So every theory that lies above this black line, in these theories you can write the scalar potentials in, in terms of a, a function w that you could call a super potential or a fake super potential. I'm not requiring them to have supersymmetry. I'm just requiring them to have, to have such a function. 
It turns out if that function exists for all scalar fields, then you can actually prove a positive math theorem. Even though these theorem, uh, theories have no dominant energy condition, you can prove a positive math theorem. Okay. Okay, and now let me add two more lines to this plot. So here's an orange line and a, a, a blue line. So everything that lies below the orange line, every theory there has a violation of the Penrose inequality. So how do I find this line? I just start somewhere in coupling space. Finally, I can use this thing. Maybe I start up here and just generate 100,000 initial data sets. I don't find any violations. I lower, I lower, I lower. I don't find anything. And finally, suddenly, at some coupling, I find a violation and I stop because it turns out I know then that the rest of the theories down here will violate it. And of course, this is an exclusion plot. I'm not saying that everything above the line is good. I'm saying that everything below the line is bad. And then I can do the same thing just looking for, uh, for negative mass solutions. Uh, so theories that violates the positive mass theorem. So just ADS is not stable. Then I get this blue line. Um, so th this whole range of theories like seem not to be compatible with holog holography. And there also seems to be a gap between the Penrose inequality and the positive mass theorem. Yeah, I'm. Yeah, so so like uh, here, I'm testing across different ranges for the mass. Does that does it vary a lot? Yeah, so I'm, let's see. Yeah, so you're asking like along the red line, what are the typical what what's the typical mass range for a violation? Yeah. Um, the first value yeah, it, it's. Most of the time, it's like somewhat big, like larger than the Hawking page transition, because of. It's not necessarily. Like the they can be at also. Uh, I haven't studied the statistics closely, but they can be at. Uh, but most of the time, they're not much less than the Hawking page mass, essentially. Yeah, um, but it's a good question. Maybe you can study the statistics of these things, um, where they typically occur, uh, typically occur. Yeah, you, you also see, well, okay, let me go to the next slide. Oh, yeah, okay, this is the uh, theory with the same mass squared, but I just removed the phi cube term, and I just did the phi to the four and phi to the six, and um, it looks like this. Same qualitative story, except somehow the two lines agree here, and I have no idea why. Maybe that's the general case, and I'm just sampling in such a way that you know I'm not able to squeeze them together here. I don't know. I don't have any good explanation for why they agree. But in both cases, they lie below this below this black line where the superpotential exists. Sorry, I'm just looking at this. I mean, they're coming together. It looks like an exponentially decaying gas or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah, I, I don't know, yeah, it's not within my resolution. Yeah, exactly, you yeah. wouldn't expect to see that. Right, that I, I agree, I don't know whether, yeah. That's true. But it's, it's not really approaching that. Right, 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 right. Um, so, so, but what do we see? We see that generic potentials violating the dominant energy condition, but satisfying the null energy condition, everything I looked at here satisfied the null energy condition. Um, but yeah, generic deck violating potential with no signs of positive mass violation do violate the Penrose inequality. And it's possible that supersymmetry is protecting top-down potentials from violating the Penrose inequality. I'm not saying that it's, a, that it's a necessary condition, but it seems that it could be a sufficient condition. Maybe there are some spinner methods you can use to try to prove the Penrose inequality, similar to how spinner methods were used to prove uh, the strength and positive mass theorems. Uh, when you don't have the dominant energy condition. Okay, so let me now talk a little bit of, about interpretations of these findings. So I kind of championed one interpretation, which is for violating theories, there is no holographic dictionary, there's no dual CFT. So this, this argument given by, by Neta and Gary just doesn't hold. 
maybe HRT fails for some reason. So that's another reason why their argument can fail, but it doesn't seem very plausible to me. Like, you know, these are smooth initial data sets at the moment, moment of time symmetry. They're complete. They're exactly in the situation where the Lukowitz Maldesena derivation is supposed to hold. Um, maybe you don't expect the Penrose inequality to hold after dimensional reduction. But I think my findings are evidence against that because if that would be true, then you would probably expect all these top-down potentials to to violate the Penrose inequality. But somehow all the you know all those potentials satisfy it. And okay, I looked at a few. I looked at a few lifts as well, uh, and then the Penrose inequality is like even more, even more far, even further away from being violated than once I looked at the uh, Penrose inequality in the lifted geometry in the cases where I can do that, to, where the compact dimensions are included. Or maybe the assumption that the microcanonical ensemble uh, does not spontaneously break time translation of symmetry is wrong. Then you have this weird situation where the microcanonical ensemble is not dual to static to a static spacetime, but instead is dual to an infinite number of time-dependent saddles, and you have to integrate over all of them. Okay, so now I've done numerics, but let me also give you an, an analytical constraint on V. That's, you know, it's a sufficient condition for violating the Penrose inequality, but it's a sufficient condition also for violating the positive mass theorem. So I guess it's more a sufficient condition for for uh, violation of the positive math theorem, that's like the better way to think of it. So a sufficient condition is the following. If you have this general potential with these general couplings, if the minimum of this one function of mu is negative, then you have negative mass solutions. Or conversely, a necessary condition for a non-perturbative stability of pure ADS is that the minimum of this one function of mu is positive. Okay, sure, this is like a minimum, but okay, this is one function of one variable, you open Mathematica, it takes you a minute to check. Uh, and, and you can think of this as a kind of BF type bound that constrains higher couplings. It has the same status as the BF bound. The BF bound is not a sufficient condition for stability, but it's a necessary one. Same for this one. And of course you can play these games where you choose some particular form of the potential and you plug it in here and then you can write down your, your like something more explicit uh, sometimes. Is this, is this figure inside? Um, yeah, good. Here, it actually fits the blue line. Okay, I haven't drawn it, but in this case, it actually lies very close to the blue line. Um, here, you see they like deviate a little bit in this region. This is the, actually the gray line here, which I didn't talk about earlier, is actually this analytical bound. So, so the numeric is a little bit stronger than this bound. And also let me just say that, I would love to say that this was a general, generalization of the BF bound. That's not entirely true, because if I just plug in like only G2 and set everything else to zero, I get something that's slightly weaker than the BF bound. So that was uh, kind of annoying. But, but uh, that's just life sometimes. But you found this theoretical result? Yes. And let me tell you how I derive it. It's not sophisticated at all. That's not a good way to do something. <laughs> 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 so, um, I hope it's not a cheery way to ask. Yeah. What is V? What is phi? The phi? Yeah, that's the scalar field that I'm looking at, the neutral scalar field, that's yeah. the only field. Field, the only field, yeah. And then this potential. Okay. And what is the mu? Mu, yeah, good. You will see. For now, mu is just a, a, you know, a parameter you're minimizing over. But you will see what mu is in this extremely sophisticated proof. Okay. <laughs> so you take, uh, you take phi. You just take uh, initial data. You say phi is this logarithmic profile, okay, that I considered earlier. And now you see this mu, it's just an amplitude of, of this scalar field. And um, then I'm just gonna literally compute the mass of this initial data. And it turns out that you can do it analytically and you get some terrible mass of gamma functions. And actually if you're willing to study those gamma functions, you generally get the analytic constraint on, on not just the positive math theorem, but the, the Penrose inequality. Because um, you, know, you have both the mass and R0 area of the so you, you can really write down kind of a similar bound that gives a, 
uh, necessary condition for not violating Penrose inequality. But, but th that's really a kind of terrible mess. So let's take the R0, this, one of these parameters to be very large. Then the mass divided by this R0 to, to the power D is just literally this expression. So when this is negative for some mu, I have just constructed a negative mass initial data set. And you, you can imagine if you just choose a little bit like more cleverly here, maybe you can get something that truly generalized the BF bound that like, you know, constructs a negative mass solution when you're just slightly below the BF bound. Okay, that was my uh, derivation. And uh, just an example, if you take this kind of uh, exponentially negative potential, you find that the positive math theorem is violated for any A if this, this uh, coefficient alpha is greater than this value. And then you can you know, play similar games. For any finite A, you can have stricter bounds on alpha. So is there an effect for this? Uh, uh, is the penalty inequality is stronger than a positive? Yeah, f it is for space times where you have a marginally trapped surface. So you can rewrite the, I mean the usual way to write the Penrose inequality, yeah, is in, in asymptotically flat four dimensional space, it's usually like m greater than square root of uh, the area of the margin trapped surface divided by 16 pi, something like that. Some gm somewhere here probably, um, yeah. Yeah, 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 good. So I can if I, if I don't take this limit here. It turns out that the dependence on, on this, this R0, it, it lives out here. So I can discriminate if I, if I don't take that limit. It just turns out that it's like, you know, it's, it's very ugly. So, um, but yeah, you can look at it. Uh, Okay, so I'm gonna do my conclusion slide, but don't relax entirely yet because I'm gonna have one slide after conclusion slide. <laughs> so you don't like, you know, get really ready for this being done. Okay, so the Penrose inequality appears to serve as a constraint on low energy quantum gravity theories. It passes consistency checks for top-down potentials. There are significant regions of coupling space where there is no sign of positive mass violation that does violate the Penrose inequality. Here's like a broad, vague question that doesn't originate with me, but like since censorship implies the Penrose inequality, but somehow you can replace this uh, assumption of censorship with ABS of T instead, is it true that quantum gravity in the form of holography enforce some notion of censorship that's just not true for GR plus generic matter? That's like a broad and vague question, but I think there could could maybe be something there. Uh, something I'm actually working on now with a grad student uh, at Santa Barbara is uh, maybe we can redo the analysis with, with charge scalars and look at the charge panels inequality. Maybe the charge panels inequality could imply the scalar weak gravity conjecture. Oh no, I forgot to change this slide. <laughs> you, you assume this in Texas. It should be the weak gravity conjecture for complex scalars. I recently learned that scalar weak gravity conjecture is something altogether different that I hadn't heard about. So the weak gravity conjecture for complex scalars, okay. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, I don't know, but maybe there could be something there. Maybe there could be some constraints on U1 gauge couplings, just like we constrained uh, these uh, couplings uh, G3 and G4. And it's actually quite promising because the proofs of the charge version in the math literature are much worse. Like they have to assume very unphysical things. Um, like the, the charge density of this uh, charged matter can't change sign outside the black hole horizon. Well, of course it can change sign outside the black hori hole horizon. So, so that's quite interesting. And then finally, like, you know, these, these bounds, you can use them to bound correlators on, on the boundary. So it would be interesting to compare with conformal bootstrap bounds. Are they related in any way? Do they exclude similar regions, complementary regions? I don't know, but I, I should really talk to some bootstrap people. Okay, and then my final slide, just a teaser. Since I'll be here the whole week, just like people are around if you want to talk about this, I have some new results that I hope to publish next week and you know, I'd be very happy to discuss them. So the thing is, uh, using holography in this paper, we prove CFT speed limits on the growth of entanglement correlators 
and Wilson lines for homogeneous states. So states where the energy density is fixed or the one-point function of the stress tensor. And here are some bounds we get. For example, in a 2D CFT, we get this. Every quantity here is a CFT quantity. C is the central charge. One-point function of the stress tensor is the CFT stress tensor. So we go into the bulk, we prove everything here, and we push everything out to the boundary. In uh, holography? Yeah, in hol holography. Yeah, leading order, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So we have no idea whether this is true for finite n or finite coupling. Maybe it could be, maybe not, we don't know. In D equals four, we do a similar thing for Wilson lines. Uh, so L is the length of, okay, circular Wilson lines. Circular Wilson lines, L of C is the length of the circle C. Lambda is the Tuft coupling. CF is the effective central charge, relates to the entanglement entropy of a sphere in the vacuum. And then we can do the same if you allow me to use the geodesic approximation for two-point functions. We can do the same for, um, for correlators, and we, we get something like that. And I'm, I'm not gonna say much more about this bounds, but it, you know, if you're interested, come and talk to me while I'm here, uh, and I'd be happy to discuss. So thank you for listening. Yeah, lambda is the uh, tough coupling. Of the boundary series? Yeah. So is that, if the whole coupling becomes large, the bound disappears? Yeah, it so looks like it. So, so yeah, I guess, the, you know, the tough coupling kind of appears in the exponent of the Wilson line. Uh, it's a prefactor, so maybe, yeah, it kind of maybe nicer to divide out the lambda here, because it should cancel the lambda that comes from, it's a log here, and there's lambda in the exponent. Uh, but yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it means that essentially the, the bulk space time is, is planar symmetric. And that means on the boundary that you know, the stress tensor of the CFT is homogeneous. It's just the same at every point. So, you know, I didn't say, to say what point I evaluated it here because it's the same everywhere. You might think that that's a terrible restriction. You might also think that, well, once you have inhomogeneities, you have like locally conserved quantities and hydrodynamic modes that tend to be like slower. So, so maybe that slows down the, the dynamics. That's not a proof of anything, but it's like a, maybe a plausibility argument that maybe these are, I mean, of course. Does this mean that all the one-point functions on the boundary are homogeneous? No. So, well, okay, yes, good, sorry. All the one-point functions are homogeneous, yeah. But you can have non-trivial correlators, you know, entanglement evolve, two-point functions evolve. But indeed, one-point functions are homogeneous. Well, one-point functions of everything that has a bulk dual, at least, uh, in the low energy. Uh, 